ahead and start recording. So I'm recording you guys as well, just so you know. Um, I have a couple of announcements for you guys. Um, I do have your groups set up. Um, I have to work out one or two more things, but I should have those up by this afternoon. Um, and I've got you guys, I think in groups of about, is it? Yeah, I've got you guys in groups of four or five. So I also got a, an upgraded version of Zoom. Um, and the schools are, we're about to have um, like school access to Zoom as well. So we don't have to meet in a weird schedule on Thursdays and Fridays anymore. We can't, I've, I've got breakout rooms. That's, that's the whole point behind my rambling here. Um, so we're I'm going to change schedules a little bit. I'll make sure to put um, a note in the update and in the group me as well. Um, we are going to start meeting on Thursdays at normal time. So 10, 20, yeah, 10, 20 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I will put you guys in breakout rooms and that's how you can do your group meetings. And that way you guys don't have to be in charge of doing that. I can do it from here and I can pop in and check on you guys throughout that period, throughout that 45 minute period. So that's good news um, because that's going to be so much easier on you guys and probably on me as well. Um, that's announcement number one. I do want to go over one thing with you guys. And that is how to, I have had a lot of people um, have problems turning in items. So here's what we're going to do. I am going to come over here. I'm going to publish a Tuesday folder. And I'll, I'll, pu I'll um, publish Thursday's folder here in just a few minutes as well. Okay, so let's open up Tuesday. I don't think you guys have anything to do on Tuesday, actually. No, you definitely don't. Right, but you do have this right here, which is what we are about to do. So if you guys want to go ahead and click on that and download it, um, that will be cool. I think you can, I think it'll, autom it'll either automatically download or it'll open over here. I think it's going to open over here. Yes, it is opening over here. That's a large. I don't want to see that big. So we're supposed to be doing this like right now. Uh, I would go ahead and do it. I don't know if you can edit it in this right here though. Let me see. Can we? No, you can't. So. You see this right here, the download? Download that and it should pop up down here. So you guys are going to be able to take notes in this because we've got, we've got a lot of history to cover before we get to US history and we have two days to do it. So we are going to, I've, I've chosen um, the three big events that happened um, in European history. And I've chosen those specific, these specific three events because they are the ones that have the most um, relevance to U.S. history and the most, uh, I guess, impact on the world that the United States is going to become a part of. Yeah, so then you can go through and edit it after that. Okay, so download that and you can edit it. And I'm going to go over here and show you guys how to... Um, upload something. Okay, so this is where, this is not for you guys. This is where I upload lesson plans and all of that. So how you upload something. So you click on the assignment, right? And then you would click on submit assignment. All right. Once you get to this page right here, you have three options. You can upload something. You can create something. So you can pull something in like an image or, um, really image and medium media would be all you guys would really need. Um, or you can go to resources. You guys should not need this button right here. It's probably just these two. All right, so upload. If you click on that right there, it will allow you to attach a file. And then you just hit submit. 
Um, if you have issues taking a picture and uploading it, that is something different. Um, if you can't get your picture to upload onto the computer, um, that's a problem we'll have to work out together. So if you run into that problem, let me know. And we can fix that. Um, to, we'll have to fix that together because it'll be something um, specific to you and only you probably. Um, that's all my announcements. Did that, did all of that make sense or do you guys have any other questions? What are we supposed to do for the uh, Tuesday folder? The thing that, you down, that we download? Oh, okay. We're about to go through that right now. So just go to your Tuesday folder, um, download that doc, that PowerPoint, and we're about to go through it right now, unless somebody else has a question about uh, the groups um, or how to turn something in. Um, mine's not a question, but okay. um, in the week two folder under Monday, it doesn't show as a PowerPoint for me. It shows as a bunch of different squares that I can move. Oh, okay, okay. So go to, do you see, your, is this the PowerPoint that we just downloaded? Um, I don't have a way to download it. Okay, so have you got your Tuesday folder? Let me see. I don't. It says week two, eight slash two four, eight slash twenty eight, and then it goes, says Monday. Huh. You can't. Can anybody else not see Tuesday? Um. Let's do this. Can't refresh your page, like your Schoology page. It's in there now. Thank okay. you. Awesome, awesome. It's probably just because I'm telling y'all my internet's slow today. It is so much fun today. All right, let's do that again. Okay, so you guys should have access to that PowerPoint. It looks like this. Um, we are going to, you guys are gonna be going through this. I'll give you the information to put in these squares. Um, it, my version is, you know, quite, um, my, my version is complete. Uh, so what I would say, and what I would advise you guys to do, um, I'm going to go through this very quickly because we have a lot of information to cover and not a whole lot of time to do so. Like we've got maybe 30 more minutes left. Um, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. But this video is being recorded. This will be up for you guys on, um, YouTube, on our YouTube channel and on Schoology um, here in hopefully, well, I say here in, a, here in this afternoon, but um, the internet is going slow. By some point this evening, this video with all of this information will be up on Schoology. So take notes while we go through. Um, to the best of your ability. And then if you don't get something, don't freak out because it's going to be here for you guys to come back to, okay? All right, so this is, we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about the Renaissance and the Reformation. On Thursday, we're gonna talk about the Crusades. Now that's a little bit backwards because the Crusades actually led to the Renaissance and the Reformation, um, but, I wanted to go through this with you guys, and then your Thursday thing is a is it's group work, so um, it's easier to divide it that way, I guess. So just keep in mind, all of this is happening um, after the Crusades, so after what we'll talk about on Thursday. So starting off, um, these are some just important words, important vocabulary for you guys to know. Um, Humanism is, uh, it's a philosophy that um, it was popular, popularized during the Renaissance and it celebrates like humanity. It celebrates humans as a people, their accomplishments, everything they've done. Um, it's kind of this idea you went from the Middle Ages where um, basically everything was just crap. Um, 
there wasn't a high education standard. There weren't, um, there weren't a lot of educated people. There was a lot of poverty, a lot of disease, a lot of um, corruption. And then you have the Crusades happen and those kind of pull Europe out of the dark ages and into this renaissance of, it's this rebirth of ideas, this rebirth of culture, art, um, science, reading, history. And it's this idea that maybe um, life isn't as bleak. It doesn't have to be as bleak. You don't have to. So in the Middle Ages, you were living your life for to get to heaven. And that was about it. That was all you had to look forward to was I got to trudge through this life to get to heaven um, because it's going to be better than this, which, you know, Christianity, that's true and all of that. Um, but this, this idea of humanism said, well, hold on, maybe, um, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe we can make something of ourselves here on earth and we can do good here and it can be okay here and then we can get to heaven. So that's humanism, and that's the basic idea behind the entirety of the Renaissance. Um, secular just means uh, it's, it's something that's not religious. So school, you often hear is secular. Um, government is supposed to be secular. Um, it's this idea that the church does not control everything, and that was a big thing for the Renaissance because the Catholic Church had so much power at that point. A patron is, y'all know what Patreon is. A patron is somebody who supports somebody else. The arts, um, at, at this time it was um, paying artists like Da Vinci and Michelangelo, um, Donatello and Raphael, the other two Ninja Turtles. Um, and those were just the big painters of the Renaissance. Mona Lisa, you should know who that is, famous painting by Da Vinci. Um, perspective, so the idea of perspective in drawing came about during the Ren Renaissance and it was the idea of um, uh, just putting depth into paintings and drawings. Uh, if I, I'll post up some pictures of pre-Renaissance art so you guys can see what that looks like because it's um, it's extremely flat and it's extremely extremely um, I don't want to say not good but it's it's very primitive. There we go. That's a good word. Um, the Prince is a famous book by uh, Machiavelli. It's about how to achieve and hold on to power. We won't go into that very um, deep. And then vernacular is just your everyday talk, how you talk. So um, the slang that we use and all of that, that's what vernacular is. All right, Italian Renaissance. Okay, so it took place in Italy. Let me try to get my annotations up. Yeah. Spotlight. All right. So the Renaissance takes place in Italy. Um, it begins in the Italian peninsula. So um, Florence is gonna be a big area. Um, where is my other big area? Uh, there is Florence, Republic of Genoa, there it is. That's gonna be huge. Um, Milan is gonna have a lot of um, action in the Renaissance. Um, and then Naples is going to see a lot as well. Sicily, of course, is going to be a huge um, area later on as we go. All right, so the Renaissance began in the city-states and the Italian peninsula. What was it? It's a flowering of art, writing, and culture that exploded in Italy and then spread throughout the rest of Europe. Um, it'll uh, end up in um, the German nations, it'll end up in uh, the UK, what we consider the UK today, France, Spain, uh, everybody kind of goes through a renaissance. When did it begin? Um, rebirth, that's what this is. It is a rebirth of all of these things. When was it? It began in the late 1400s and continued on to the next century or for the next century. That's my mouse. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, who was involved in it? Merchants in city like, cities like Florence and Venice, um, and Naples is another big one. They become patrons of the arts and their, as their wealth grew. So they begin paying people to start painting and paying people to start um, uh, creating art, writings, music, um, paintings, of course, um, but also um, they started doing sculptures and statues. Um, the Sistine chapels are gonna be painted at this time. It's, um, and it's all funded by wealthy merchants. So people who were pa uh, not patronizing, but um, 
patroning, there we go, other people. Um, why is it important or why did it happen? Let's go to how first. So how did it happen? Um, as wealth flowed into the Italian city-states, merchants had the money to spend on beautifying their homes and cities, and they became the patrons of the arts and paid artists to create works of art for them. Um, why it came about. So this is gonna be after the Crusades. So the Crusades are fought over here. So you can't really get it. Here's the very, very edge of the Ottoman Empire, and it's gonna go down into um, Jerusalem and the, the side of Africa, which would be down here. Um, the Crusades go on through these areas because they were fighting uh, Islamic um, groups. I guess you could say, because there were, there were a couple of separate empires that they were fighting. They were fighting separate groups of Turks. Um, so as they expanded out towards that, you see many trade routes that are going to be passed through um, and are going to start extending up into Italy and into Europe. So that's going to be places like the Silk Road, where they bought silk from China, um, the gold and salt trade, which is going to go through the Middle East, um, over into Eastern Asia. Uh, and then it's going to bring wealth to the merchants and the city states there. So they start um, gathering more and more um, goods, stuff like silk, stuff like gold, salt, tea. It's going to eventually be gunpowder. What's up? Okay, sorry. All right. So that is what's going on. That's why all of this is happening. That's how it all happens. You guys should not have this slide. Let me make sure you don't have this slide. Right, good. Where did you go? There you are, okay. So y'all don't have this one, we're skipping it. You don't have the Sistine Chapels. All right, but let me, I do want to show you. Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in Rome. This was painted by Michelangelo, 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 however you want to say it. Um, and he um, painted it because the Catholic Church asked him to. They gave him uh, a commission to go in and paint the ceiling. All right, literary works of the Renaissance. This is going to be something that you do have. I want you guys to know these four works. All right, the prince is gonna be important, not just for the Renaissance, but also it's gonna be important as we start talking about the development of democracy and what it is. And we'll do a, um, a section on that next Tuesday and the different types of government before we jump into US history, US history, which will start on next Thursday. All right, so the prince is important um, because it is a, uh, it's a political writing, a treatise is just, it's a writing that was written in the Italian vernacular, so in Italian slang, and helped make that more common. It spoke openly about the need to hold onto power by a ruler through sometimes immoral means. So it's this idea that um, people in power sometimes do immoral acts and sometimes they have to do immoral acts to stay in power. Um, that's, you see that in every single type of government in the world. You see it in democracy, you see it in socialism, communism, Marxism, which is communism, socialism. Uh, you see it in fascism, monarchies, oligarchies, the, um, theocracies. You see it in every possible um, government body. Um, Don Jose is uh, a, it's, it's basically a comedy. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, it's really, really old comedy, but it's still, we had to, I had to read it in college. Um, and if it's if you enjoy that kind of writing, it's very very funny. Um, if you don't enjoy it, it it's not that. Uh, it's I guess it's it's a little bit. Um, it's a difficult read. How about that? We'll go with that. Um, in praise of folly is a Christian humanist work. Um, so this is an attack on superstition in European society, and it helped lead the way to the Protestant Reformation, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, it's superstitions on like um, what makes a witch, um, superstitions on, uh, the, it, was, it was superstitions that were prominent during the plague era. So when the Black Plague took over Europe and all of that, uh, yes, you can copy the text word for word, go for it. Um, because this is all information that you're just going to have to, you're just going to need. 
Um, yeah, so that's Praise of Folly. Just know that it's important for the Protestant Reformation. Divine Comedy um, is written by Dante. Uh, this is Dante's Inferno. You've probably heard about that before. It's what happens in the afterlife, um, and it's going to standardize the Italian language. And it's also the vision of hell that became, it's the vision of hell that you, you still kind of think of, except that it's in, it's in levels. Um, there was actually a really cool movie made about this. What, what is the name? Um, As Above, So Below. That's what it was. It's a horror movie. I should probably be telling you guys to watch that. But um, it's, a very, it's a terrifying movie. I, I couldn't sleep for like probably weeks after I watched it. But it was, it was a really cool um, reference to um, Dante's Inferno. Let me make sure you guys have this. Okay, y'all don't have the Northern Renaissance. All right, so skip this one. Uh, this is just the idea that the Renaissance changed and it, um, as, as it expanded, it changed. That's all you gotta know there. Humanism during the Renaissance, this is important, okay? Um, so humanism is the, it, it's a literary movement, it's a philosophy, um, it's going to take over the ideas that were going through medieval works. So the medieval times, the Middle Ages, were all focused on religion. All of them were focused on heaven. Like we, we really can't conceive of just how deeply religious the people of the Middle Ages were because we don't have, you know, we have other things going on. Like as a person, like as, as for entertainment, you know, you've got Facebook, social media, Instagram, um, you've got books, movies, you've got classes, computers, um, the internet, you've got so much under, so much out there that you can um, escape into, I guess. People in the Middle Ages didn't have that. It's kind of, um, the, the example I've always used is if you've ever been on like a mission trip or you've ever been to a third world country, um, uh, like Haiti, um, the Dominican Republic in some areas, places, parts of Africa or India, um, a few areas in Nepal. All of these places are um, very, very impoverished. And the people there, when they get a hold of religion, um, be it Christianity, um, Islam, Judaism, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, wh whatever it might might be, it becomes the only thing that they hold on to. Um, and like I've been to, um, I've been to the Dominican Republic several times on mission trips, and it is it's very astonishing because you don't we don't understand it because we have so much else going on and then they don't. So that's kind of like what it was in the Middle Ages. Um, it's this just hardcore religion. Humanism changed that. Um, humanism said we can be better. We want to have a better society. We want to live. It, we've got to live in this world, let's make something of it. Um, it thought that education, art, um, writings, critical thinking, those are important things. So things that we still hold on to today. Um, and it's important to study the humanities. So it's important to study history. It's important to study poetry, philosophy, English, grammar, all of that. Um, and that's really where um, our education systems are going to start get, get kick-started. Uh, back in, I mean, and you, you, it's Western culture, so it's Westernized um, ideas and beliefs. Um, important people, um, we're not going to go over the important works at this time, you guys can copy that down. Um, and writers and philosophers, Thomas More, who wrote about uh, Utopia, which is a model society, and I think, um, I'm fairly certain, I'm fairly certain Karl Marx used him as a uh, used his utopian idea for communism and for socialism. It's this idea that it's based on the inherent goodness of people. Um, um, we've already talked about that and we've already talked about Machiavelli. So just make sure you know these three people. All right, effect, what effect did humanism have on Europe? It encouraged learning and art and helped build the Renaissance. Don't worry about this at all. So that didn't. It's not supposed to be there. All right, we got 10 minutes. So we're gonna go through the Protestant Reformation so fast. Um, okay, so Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, the first Martin Luther, um, and his problems inside the church, okay? Um, he was, um, 
he's the one who, if you, if you think about Protestant churches, if you think about um, Church of Christ, Baptist, um, uh, well, obviously Protestant churches, um, but Baptist, Church of Christ, Church of God to an extent, um, Methodist, it would be in there. Uh, those are probably the big ones. Uh, non-denominational, those are Protestant, those are based on Martin Luther's ideas. So the church, the Catholic church was selling indulgences, which was then saying, hey, buy this piece of paper and it's going to get you into heaven. That doesn't work, according to Martin Luther. He posted 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, to begin the Protestant Reformation. So he had 95 problems with what the Catholic church was doing. He did not have a problem with um, their belief in Jesus, um, the basic principles of Christianity. He just had problems with um, how they were trying to sell Christianity, if that makes sense. Effect on Europe. Many people supported his ideas and the printing press spread his Bible across Europe. Um, so it became, it went from only the Catholic Church can hold on to Bibles and only the Catholic Church and the priests and the bishops can read it and tell you what's in the Bible to everybody can read it because it's in the common language. Um, everybody can get a hold of it and they can start reading the Bible and think for themselves. Um, key ideas. Um, he believed that you could only achieve salvation through faith in God. You can't buy your way into heaven. It's not about works. It's about a combination of those two things. And he believed in being taught from the Bible and from the Bible alone. So no, nothing else is um, important to Christianity. The Bible and what God has laid out in the Bible is what's important. So these are beliefs that are still held by um, Baptists, Church of Christ, Church of God, um, Methodists. Um, to an extent, some evangelists, but evangelists tend to be more um, Catholic leaning. Okay, so we're going to go on down. I'm sorry, I'm going really fast. Problems in the church. Uh, he said that there were, the leaders are corrupt. The Pope had too much power, which was true. Uh, the Pope um, at that time did have too much power. The Pope was basically um, a catalyst for any king or monarch who wanted to have some kind of extra power, they had to go through him. Um, sale of indulgences is unfair and priests weren't educated. Uh, his 95 theses are his list of complaints against the church that he nailed to the door. He was super brave to do that because the Catholic church had a, a lot of power at the time and he could have been killed without question. Okay, very quickly through these last couple. Printing press, uh, created by Johannes Gutenberg. Um, it is a movable type printing press. It's um, like, it's a printer today, basically, but it's the very first version of it. Prior to it, they were recreated by hand, um, and it was usually done by, I think it was done by, it was done by monks and nuns. Um, oh yeah, it says it right there. Um, it made them very expensive and very few people could buy them, so very few people in Europe could read. Um, this revolutionized that. Um, Gutenberg was a blacksmith and a goldsmith who experimented with printing systems to create a movable type um, and he could quickly create and print pages. What did his printing press do? Um, it could very easily and quickly print pages for books so they could be produced cheaply and quickly. Um, the Gutenberg Bible was his first one which spread quickly across Europe. Uh, it helps increase literacy as more people learn to read and can afford books, and it helped spread Protestant beliefs because Bibles became um, ubiquitous. They, they, they were everywhere. Okay, very quickly, through Henry VIII, um, which if anybody you're going to remember from history, please remember Henry VIII because he's such an important person. Um, so Protestantism took over in England because of Henry VIII. Um, and all of his many children. He had six marriages, two of whom he had executed. Um, so Catherine of Argonne, who was his first wife, she um, bore him no sons. So he cut off her head because he, he needed a son to um, continue his lineage. Uh, Anne Boleyn thought, was his, go ahead. I thought he divorced his first one. Catherine? 
They did divorce Catherine. Hold on, hold on, hold I thought on. I it was told... divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Dor- I think you're right. You are right. You are right. Because it's Anne Boleyn who is the first one who gets her head chopped off. You're right. You're right. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do our, our check real fast. A little Google check. Yep. So, correct. Thank you. Was that Aurora? Yeah, it was. Thank you. So, yes, Catherine of He's Aragon. Been- divorced her. Um, he had to get permission from the Pope to do that. He could not get permission to divorce her. So he was like, okay, well, we're going to switch to Protestants, Protestantism so I can divorce her. So goodbye to Catherine of Aragon. Hello to Anne Boleyn. Uh, beheaded her. She gave him daughters or a daughter. Jane Seymour, he married in hopes of a son. Um, she died because of complications. She did have a son, Edward, who was extremely sickly and did not make it for very long. He married his second Anne, um, Anne of Cleves. Uh, she, they were an alliance, um, but he really did not like her or her looks. Poor Anne. Catherine Howard, so the second Catherine, um, and then the third Catherine, who is the final wife who survived Henry. All right. So the only ones that we really usually talk about, though, are the ones who gave him his daughters and then Edward. All right. We did not do the Counter-Reformation. We are going to do the timeline of the Reformation in Europe. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to talk very, very fast because we have three minutes. All right. So timeline of the Reformation in Europe. Martin Luther posts the 95 Theses. Um, He appears before the Diet of Worms to answer charges of heresy. So he appears before the Catholic Church to um, answer um, charges of coming against them. He publishes the New Testament in German. Ken- Henry VIII rejects the Pope's power in England and has his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled. So when it says he rejects the pow- Pope's power, he, um, he didn't like the answer the Pope gave him. King Henry VIII declared himself to be the supreme head of the Church of England. This is where you're going to get um, evangelism and Anglicanism. Um, And that's going to come down through his daughters and through Edward. Um, Spanish soldier turned priest. Uh, Y'all, I can't say his name, and I'm not going to try because I always screw it up. He founds the Jesuit order, part of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. John Calvin is going to be... um, uh, the, the the pushing of Calvinism. He institutes the, he publishes the Institutes of the Christian Religion on Protestantism, and it's going to, that's what uh, Calvinism is going to stem from. Uh, the Council of Trent begins as part of the Catholic Church's Counter-Reformation, and then the Peace of Augsburg, which grants toleration to Lutherans in the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, um, I think you guys do have this last slide as well, don't you? Yes. We have pretty much talked about all of these. We've already talked about the 95 Theses. We've talked about indulgence. Predestination, this is a big part of Calvinism. It's the teaching that God already knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved, um, and that you can't do anything about that talks about the printing press the Anglican church is going to be the new church of England after Henry VIII broke from the Catholic church so he's going to be the one that says okay we're going Protestant because and we're going to become the Anglican church um what ended up happening with the Anglican church is that it um god we have less than one it became it, it, it became um basically Catholic um okay I've got to stop because we have less than one minute um if you guys have questions please um, shoot me a message through GroupMe, an email, um, or anything like that. I will make sure that this makes it onto Schoology this 